Well, my name is Joe Thompson, and I'm 41 years old. And all of my life, you know, I've duck hunted. I've uh, been avid. Um, I worked male dogs. I never, I've never actually owned um, a female. My dad had a girl named Maggie once, but for the most part, they've all been male, large breed dogs. Um, and I, I, I was avid hunter, upland game, duck hunting, stuff like that. Um, and then my dad ended up, you know, he got cancer, and that was five years of being tube fed, not being able to eat, um, and trying to get through it. And he eventually passed away from that. Um, during of which, uh, you know, I lot, a lot of things went to the wayside, such as, you know, upkeep on four wheelers and all these things. And, and there was no way to get my deer hunting gear into the shack. There was no way to, you know, take my family, in there and haul gear unless you wanted to hike and put on your backpack and then once you got there you couldn't really do much and you know when you go for a weekend or even a a week you got a lot of gear just in water and and food and stuff and it dawned on me one day you know i wonder if ringo um could pull some of this stuff and help me out and again ringo was purchased uh when my dad got sick because i wasn't doing very well And my wife said, you know, you need to get a pal. And she basically said, I don't care what it is, you know, find yourself a dog. And that's how I ended up getting Ringo. And, um, and then of course, dad got sick and all of that. And then, um, I started to use Ringo to pull in my gear so that at least the walk in wasn't so bad trying to, you know, carry it. And I wouldn't have to make two or three trips in and stuff like that. I was able to make it one swoop and get in there and he started to do that and, and enjoy it. He'd, I'd pull out the harness and he'd get excited. He knew he was helping me, he knew he was a part of something. And I just fell in love with the breed and Ringo. And then throughout all this, I would take photos and picture. Um, I never went to breeding or anybody. I had no intentions of it. Uh, I didn't go to TV or anything either. Um, I just kept doing what I do, posting about what I do. And, and the public seemed to respond to it very, well and um so we had fox 21 do a couple of stories on us about using the dogs and the story behind it and you know how i got into working them and then a gal named deb jones from thunder run mastiffs and years ago if you even googled the word mastiff all you would get was deb jones thunder run and her lines and stuff like that she had some of the largest in the world and she saw pictures of ringo and said who is that boy he looks like one of mine and that was basically the beginning of our conversation. And then she mentored me from that point on about how to do it right, make sure you have the OFA and everything done and health testing and the genetic health testing and to do it right. And she set up a breeding, which resulted in Harrison. And I kept Harrison. Uh, he's 247 pounds of pure muscle, works every day. And uh, that's Ringo's firstborn son in history. Um, and everything went from there. Then I ended up keeping Paul and my wife absolutely off since one of the things that drew me to, to my wife back in the day was she was a young, beautiful gal that loved older music and the Beatles in particular. And so when it came to keeping more dogs, the only agreement was I get to name them. And I thought, well, if you're going to let me keep 700 pounds of dog in the house, <laughs> the least I can do is let you name them. Uh-huh. And it just caught, it caught on. And so you got Ringo, Harrison, Paul, and John. John is not of my blood. He is completely out of Deb, um, Thunder on Mastiffs. And his father has been dead 12 years. So it was 12 year frozen semen um, where John came from. And I needed, I did need one dog not related in case past clients that kept pups of mine wanted to use me again. I needed to have a stud with, um, with no relation to mine. Um, and again, my studs have to earn being called a stud john's not a stud paul's not a stud yet uh i usually wait till three years old to make sure there's no strange things that come cropping up and i don't believe an animal that large is mature until three and in my history their semen seems to get better after that point a lot of people will tell you that i'm wrong not in my experience or my repro vets experience um when you collect a dog at a year old it could be very very it can be bad, good, clean out. The, the semen itself needs to mature. Uh, sometimes the freezing can go bad because it's young. So really, I don't even get 
uh, until they're three and I can see that they've had a great three years and are doing very well and there's no strange things cropping up. And then the next step is then I get them tested for their OFA and their genetic testing. Uh, sometimes I do the genetic testing prior because it's just a swab. But, uh, um, and that's when I start looking at them as potentially stuff. Um, so right now I offer Ringo and Harrison. Paul is not ready yet. He just turned three and he's undergoing his testing. I'll probably offer him sometime this fall or spring. Um, and then John has a ways to go. He's not even a year old yet. So, so that's the immediate plans with, with that. But, but getting started was basically just letting a dog be a dog, letting it be a part of your life and, you know, making sure you got them out every day for some kind of exercise. And when you're dealing with giant breeds, you want to be joint conscious. So I do a lot of swimming. Um, a lot of this breed does not swim. They won't even put a toe in the water. And people come to me and I say, go into the water and scream and look ridiculous and pretend like you're drowning. Your dog will come in. Mm -hmm. and, and it works. And once they realize that they're buoyant and they feel and they they get into it. It's like they never want to turn back. Imagine being 247 pounds and then going in the water and how you could leap like a gazelle and mm -hmm. float around. I mean, and once they do that, it seems to, and it's about the best exercise you could ever imagine. I actually walk upstream. Once they get in the water, I'll walk upstream and rather than walk on all those boulders, they'll swim and they can even gain ground where if you jumped in, it would whisk us both away a block down the river so fast it's almost where i cannot understand how they can do it um and i had a a man that runs the mastiff museum steve O, oh, steve oifer talked to me about why that's possible and it's pretty interesting um it just has to do with how they're built and and stuff uh how they can do it but they can and, and again you know 45 minutes of just treading water is joint friendly and it works every muscle that you could think of there is no gym workout that could hit on every one of those things. And that's why doing all terrain type stuff is really important because their job isn't to look good in a gym. It's to look good out in the field and mm -hmm. to be able to, to dominate that terrain and get through it and not turn around. What good is a search and rescue dog or a protection dog that runs and comes to a crick and is too afraid to cross it. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I find desirable in, in, in the breed. So I try to make sure that, it's a fine balance between being a gentleman and knowing when to uh, step up to the plate and when to just chill out. And so far, I've, I've been nothing but impressed with, uh, with their temperament and demeanor. And again, you know, some of them can make a novice dog handler look like a pro. And that's the truth. They're, they're that gentle and intelligent and laid back. It's mm -hmm. just they really fit the human pace. Um, in a way that I can't describe. In other words, you know, when you have an upland game dog, you you could run all day long, all day long, every day from morning till dark and never ever even scratch the surface of working that dog. And that's the truth. You just can't do it. Unless you're an upland game hunter and do those things, you know, that breed suffers because they need a tremendous amount of exercise. That's They were bred for a hundred years to chase birds and wild game and and they have that capability so you know they, they just need a tremendous amount of exercise so you should definitely have you know that that capability if you're going to have that kind of breed you know i know everybody loves labs and they're all american dog but they are a hunting dog and that's what they were bred for and they need a tremendous amount of exercise in order to behave not eat stuff and constantly chew uh, all of that stuff, uh, have a do having a dog that feels like he accomplished a task, he's tired, the good kind of tired, uh, they behave better, they do everything better, and they grow better, and so on and so forth. So, you know, when it comes to choosing a dog, you know, unless you're a jogger, I wouldn't even consider uh, getting a lab or a golden retriever, because they need a tremendous amount of exercise to be healthy and to, to, to have the type of life that they were bred for. Mm -hmm. um, high high energy there with a mastiff you know they're more of a human pace meaning they can they can put in two three good hours of some serious hills but uh they're going to be just as tired as you are at the end of the day where you know you did that with a lab and he'll be panting at you going come on come on come on let's go let's go we're not done and you know so it's kind of nice to have a dog um match your pace 
So I'm a big guy and, and I'm slow and steady and so is the breed. And that's one of the things I enjoy about them a great deal. Can you talk about the, the, the history of the English Mastiff? And... Absolutely. Um, they're one of the oldest known breeds um, in the world. They stemmed from a dog called the Molosser. Um, and uh, that was a close quarters guardian dog um, that was originally bred for, like they said, close, co- close quarters guardianship. As it went on, they became... You know, there was the Alpine Mastiff, which was a stem from it, um, and you got the English Mastiff. And some breeders used those dogs for close quarters guardianship, and some used them for hunting. And what they would do, the, the dog's job wasn't to kill or hurt the animal. It was to hold it so that the hunters could catch up. They didn't want a dog ripping their food to shreds. Um, and that is similar when, when you have this breed and a person breaks into your house, they don't rip them to shreds they grab them and pin them in a corner there's a lot of evidence for this and stories out there um and the dog no matter what that person does will just hold them there until the master comes or the police comes or whatever so a guy might get in your house if he's dumb enough to hear the bark behind the door and still want to come in uh but he'll never be able to leave and and again nothing the, the person won't get harmed they'll just get held um and so that's what they were they were bred for it was to to hold the game um, till the hunters could catch up and dispatch it uh, for food, and then they had certain ones that they kept at the at the the castle or wherever they lived for close quarters guardianship. Um, so you kind of had two stems of that. There was down to only four hundred mastiffs on on the planet at one point, and they had to use other breeds to try to save them. Some bred with uh, French mastiffs, some bred with uh, with uh, Saint Bernards. Uh, some bred with beans to try to save the breed and then breed it back out because again they were down to only 400 of them on earth at one point um so that is the basic history of the mastiff um when you think of all other dog breeds all of them have a have a part of mastiff in them um the the bulldogs the bull mastiff the the um the king cane corso the all of those breeds, they all stem from Mastiff blood um, and then were diverged for their specific purposes after that. So when I when I speak of that Mastiff, I always say, you know, it's the least watered down breed or the least, um, the breed that did, see, when you have a dog that was bred to retrieve, it becomes sort of like more robotic and the fact that he has this inbred purpose to, to constantly retrieve something. So that takes his focal point off of your safety. Um, with a dog like this, his only real breeding, the only reason he exists was to protect humans and uh, to hold big game so that you that aid you in the hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you know, what good would it do if you had a dog, you know, six miles ahead of you chasing that, that game animal that far ahead of you? They, so they, were, they naturally stay within a decent range so that they can catch up to this animal and hold it and let you do that, uh, let you dispatch it and, and eat it. Uh, without ruining the meat and all that kind of stuff so so they in essence you get when you when you get master from from akc blood where it's traced and recognized and all of that you know that these dogs haven't been bred for any other purpose other than to to love you to watch over you to to help you and their only concern is you and that's very evident when you go from one breed say you know newfoundland to to English Mastiff or whatever, you'll definitely see a different, um, a different intelligence level. Or I, I don't, I don't know how to say it. It's not. It's just there's no purpose for the dog other than to be what he is, which is a companion, mm-hmm. and to make sure you're safe. There is no other. He doesn't have any other desires. And and like I said, that's extremely evident. You know, my kids will be playing out in the yard, and the one will fall down. And no matter what those dogs are doing, they'll get up and run and stand over him. Right over the body. You know, if he lays down, he'll stand right over him and look around. Because he knows when when a child falls that he's vulnerable, that something could run up. So even if they're just playing or if they're climbing trees and they get too high, you'll hear the dogs bark and be like, okay, they don't like that because they know you're getting into the danger zone Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so it's one of those things where, you know, you're sitting in the house and if you hear him bark, it's not like a diff- it, you know you better go out and look. 
it's and there's some peace of mind there you know they'll, they'll let me know if there's anything that i need to be worried about uh right off the bat mm-hmm. and that like i say that helps you kind of work throughout the day and know that your kids are out in the yard and, and that they got somebody there that's not going to let anything happen and if anything did you'd be the first to know so mm-hmm. um that's basic history of of the mastiff uh through the years you know a lot of people have I've used them for for pulling carts, uh, things like that. Um, but for the most part, their their main main breeding is for close quarters guardianship and for hunting, and just be a, a pal that pays attention and be a part of your life. And and again, they're they're one of them dogs. You know, if you if you hurt their feelings, you can see it in their eyes and in their expression. And it's just I haven't seen that in other breeds so much. I always compare the mastiff to a gorilla. Uh, they remind me more of a mountain gorilla than any other animal, uh, just the way the way they are. So, mm-hmm. so one of the one of the things about you know you as a AK, as a breeder of AKC dogs, you need to adhere to that standard. Meaning, you know these dogs have to make make us make a certain. They have to be quality, and they have to be you know what they have to be. However. Through the years, that's been, in my opinion, obscured to the degree that instead of building from the inside out, they now build from the outside in. That looks is the only thing that matters, and how to get there um, doesn't matter. Meaning, you know, if you have a dog with these great characteristics and you line breed, which, you know, what that can do is lock in that beautiful mass, lock in that, that beautiful head, lock in that height, that mass. Um, because you're using relatives in the same blood, but over time, that's going to cause health issues, big time. And so to me, it's very important to to do breedings such as that, but also do breedings with, with pedigrees and names that are AKC registered and all of that, but may not necessarily have all the big names in it, because this is blood that nobody's ever touched or saw or, or even has any idea what what's really going to go down. So then I have them go through you know, the OFA, all the health testing and all the genetic testing to know that, you know, we are doing the absolute best we can. And, you know, that can be 2K for a girl just to get approved to be able to use one of my guys. All my guys are tested. um, And then I prove them out in the field that way also. But for me, I tend to look at the inside and the outside and try to find a blend of the two. Instead of saying, you know, this dog has, carries DM, but he's awesome. So I'm going to breed him with this per this girl because he looks great. Well, to me, you know, carrying something is not good. Uh, it's not a show over, meaning if you bred a, a dog that had one copy of a bad gene to a clear female, it's not going to hurt anything. But it certainly isn't necessarily going to benefit anything either. Now, if you say, no, I'm not going to use a stud or a girl that carries something, and I'm only going to breed dogs that pass all of these tests, you know from day one that you did absolutely everything you possibly could for this breed to make sure that it is good from the inside. And then if, if, if for some reason, you know, there was a quality lost in that, but I have not had that happen. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, there's a, there's not a lot of difference between a 200 pound physically fit man and a 230 pound man, meaning there's Mike Tyson and there's Tank Abbott. Mm Mm-hmm. Which one to you looks more fierce? Which one, lo- which one to you uh, leaves you going, wow? Now, when I see a great big, giant, saggy, chubby, you know, that doesn't leave me in a wow state, even though they're heavier. And it certainly doesn't make me go, wow, look at, you know, how, you know, if your dog, if your guard dog can't get up on a dime, and I'm talking right now, If it takes your dog five minutes to get up and stretch, he's not going to help you in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those I constantly, even when they're puppies, I teach them the best I can to lay down slowly with intention, to walk with intention, and to be able to build the muscle to lay down like a cat rather than a heavy person throwing themselves in a recliner. I believe that's a, a huge reason why you'll see all these hygromas on dogs on their elbows and these great big black patches. My, you know, you can't get any bigger than 247 pounds and Harrison will never have one of those nasty black patches on his elbows as long as I breathe Mm -hmm. because because that's how it is. If they don't possess the muscle, if it's just weight, you have to throw yourself down. And when you do that, it's going to hurt your elbows over time. You think of how many times a dog lays down in a lifetime 
And if he's throwing himself to the floor, that's not acceptable, not on my watch. So I make them hold positions if I can using treats. I start them young that way. Um, holding positions as much as I can. You know how Bruce Lee would tell you if you held your arm out just forever, it would build the most amazing muscle ever mm -hmm. just by holding your hand still out and outward. It's sort of like that as much as you can. And that's easier on the joints. It's holding a position rather than repetitive use. Um, and so I'm a big fan of deep mud, water, snow, and joint friendly stuff right down to how they lay down. Um, and again, there's, there's massive set of walk with a flop. They just, they put their feet wherever, like, I don't care. Flop, flop, flop. That's not how I want my dogs to move. I want them to place their feet carefully with intention and authority and know what they're, you know, know that they're confident in their step and confident in their abilities. And, you know, so if we do hills, they have to go down just as much as they have to go up. Because if you only went up hills, you'd only build the rear. You wouldn't build the front. And so you need balance and balance with those dogs is important if you've got a tiny rear and a giant front end that's not right and not good for them or a giant rear and a tiny front end isn't very good either uh you try to maximize and, and compensate for all of that and in a gym setting there's no way there's absolutely no way that you could recreate any of those things so i mean you might get a good physique bodybuilding a dog but it's not the proper physique it's not not a natural physique and it's not a physique that would help them in the real world mm -hmm. so that's that's how I why I do it the way that I do it, and I know at the end of the day I couldn't have worked every one of those muscle groups better than the Woods did. So, you know that's why a deer can jump the way he does. That's why wolves can run the way they do and have that type of stamina. That's why all of it is there, and you know everything out there is nutritious from the dust going in their nose to the minerals in the grass to all of it. It's all natural and 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 a part of it. You know my dogs take dust baths. I let them. They do that for a reason. It helps with bugs. It helps with sunburn. It helps with allergies. It helps with a lot of stuff. Yeah, they're a little dirty, but that's the way they're supposed to be. He knows. They know what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, those dogs can teach you a great deal. And, you know, it doesn't mean when I go do breedings, I don't give them a luscious bath. Of course I do. But, uh, you know, I put up with the dirt and I brush my dogs rather than bathe them. When you continuously bathe them to make them like a stuffed animal, you're going to have skin issues, ear infections, pustules, and all sorts of problems because they need those oils and greases that their body naturally produces to have healthy skin. And, you know, everybody wants this clean house dog. Well, you know, I wouldn't bathe them more than once a month and I'd use the, the softest detergents humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And then use a ferminator or a brush to clean them. The brushes clean all that loose dirt and stuff just as good as as washing, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the the quality of the skin and the oils. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's all part of it. It's all part of it. You know that mud and everything that's so good to exfoliate their skin and and you know to date I don't have any allergy issues. I think I would. I think I would have allergy issues if I bathed them obsessively and didn't let them do what they do. I, I might, but. That, you know, up to date, you know, th there's a lot of allergies within the breed and I don't have it. Um, I, I haven't had a bad vet visit yet. And I definitely attribute that to letting a dog be a dog, letting him teach you a little bit yeah. and keeping him a huge part of your life. If you got a dog, you're afraid to take to the grocery store for whatever reason, or, if, you know, worried about opening the door that it'll jump out the traffic. You either need to train that dog, send him to somebody to have him trained so he can be a part of your life or think about getting a different breed mm -hmm. that matches, matches your pace. You know, one of the things I will warn, if you're an elder, elderly person and you have, let's say, a heart condition, and this is stuff I've read through research, and you own a Mastiff and you go down and you have to hit the lifeline button on your necklace or something, and the paramedics come all dressed up in white, five, six people come into your house to try to save your life, good luck because that dog ain't letting them touch you. Mm-hmm. And so I don't recommend elderly people that live alone to own one of these dogs because I believe it could be counterproductive in the event that they do need help. Um, that dog will stand over the fallen owner and not let. And you have to think of that from a dog's perspective. All these people in white and beeps and buzzards and, and cords and masks and all this stuff. And they're going, no, 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 no. I don't know what's going on, but you ain't touching my person mm -hmm. you know and so 
you know, definitely not, not, not for that type of person. Um, they're definitely not for everybody, but, but I, I believe, you know, they can fit a wide variety of, of people's lifestyle. And so can any other breed provided, you know, you put the thought into what type of person you are and what type of companion you want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the biggest thing right off the bat. So, you know, you see somebody with a shepherd or a lab, hopefully that, you know, hopefully they're, they're very active people because if not, they're going to have trouble or dogs, dogs that don't get exercised enough or dogs that, that need more exercise and aren't getting it suffering because of it. So, you know, that's kind of a tough question because in truth, the AKC standard is there to protect and preserve the breed and make sure people aren't, you know, screwing it up, I guess, is, is a, the best way I can put it. Um, I like most of everything that the standard um, states. However, you know, there are some, some things I don't really agree with, such as there are black mastiffs. And they're absolutely beautiful, and they're not registrable. Uh, there are piebald mastiffs that are absolutely beautiful, 100% genetically a mastiff, but they're not recognized by AKC. Uh, you'll get breeders say, "We'll get a short-haired Bernard if that's the color you want." And to me, that's you know, I, I guess I would change that. Um, I would change that. You know, if you have a great pedigree your AKC, your bloodlines are great, and you happen to be black or piebald, it shouldn't make any difference. They're still AKC, a Mastiff, and it shouldn't be frowned upon for people that enjoy uh, that type of, of color um, combination. So I guess the pettiness over the color is one of the things that I would that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't do uh, breedings beyond that. I did do one piebald breeding just to rock the boat. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, Yep, I did do that, and uh, they, it was one of the best litters, health-wise, everything that that I ever did. Uh, the genetic diversity was was unbelievable. She had a half Australian ped and uh, working dog pedigree and show dog, and uh, it turned out to be a, a very awesome breeding. And nobody in the world would ever know the mom was a piebald ever, never. Mm -hmm. They're all beautiful, regular, normal, but they do carry the piebald gene. But again, you know, I don't allow breeding rights. You know, my pups can't be sold for with breeding rights to the highest bidder to do whatever they want with. I protect that, you know, very much so, and that's for the breed. That's so that, you know, that it doesn't get. So I don't intentionally breed for any anything like that. Um, however, I'm not scared to. I'm not. If you are genetically an AKC Mastiff and have the same history and pedigrees as some of these other ones, but your color is different, that's not going to make me change uh, what you have to bring to the table, you know. So I, I'll stand behind that forever. Um, and so I guess the overall attitude that AKC has, which is, you know, put the visual above everything else, um, is something I wish was was different however when you are showing a dog um it is for breeding that's what showing is about and so all of these dogs should be health tested to the highest degree mm -hmm. um and that's always a good thing so if you are seeing a nice beautiful stud in the show ring um if he doesn't have his health testing he sure as hell shouldn't be in that show ring in my opinion um i don't show that way i show a different way so i don't know if they're allowed to show if they aren't tested or not uh, I don't know that. Um, I guess that'd be something I'd have to ask around and find out. But um, I've often fantasized that one day I'm going to grab the fur beetles, show up at a show, run through the whole entire building right out in the middle without telling anybody and run up the building and leave and go home. And I might do that. Yeah. <laughs> like kind of stre streaking the whole arena, but yeah. not nude with my dogs and leaving. And I might do it someday. I've been invited to specials and stuff like that. But truth is, you know, I love the woods for a reason. And I do have, you know, anxiety and, and uh, PTSD and and that's another thing these dogs help with to a degree I could never describe um, as a therapy dog and a dog that breaks the ice and gives a conversation piece and to make sure I'll tell you what when I'm at a gas station and those dogs heads are sticking out the window nobody is looking at me nobody cares what I'm wearing nobody cares if I have a booger nobody cares they are not paying and it really does kind of break that ice um, you know even my kids you know, I had a shy ch uh, kid. Well, as soon as these dogs got into his life, that all went to the wayside, and I saw it help in, in ways that, that I can't describe. You know, imagine being 10 years old, 
walking a 247 pound dog that you trust with your life that will not tug on you or nothing and how cool you must feel as a 10 year old or nine year old boy uh it's got to be it's got to be something else i never had these as a child but i did have large breeds i remember my newfoundland and thinking he was he was just the coolest dog to take around and till this day i still have him tattooed on my right arm oh, that's um, awesome. when he died i said i'll carry you with me forever and i had a photograph taken and then it transferred onto a tattoo and all my pedigrees carry Karu as the middle name and his name was Mushta Karu, which means black bear in Finnish. So all of my dogs have Karu as their middle name in honor of Moose. Oh, awesome. So, awesome. Yep. I kept my word to the highest degree. I carry him on my arm and I carry him in pedigrees. Uh, he was a great, great boy and probably was the reason I absolutely fell in love with those larger breeds. Um, very similar temperament to the Mastiff. Um, and the same type of, I don't want anything to happen to you, um, motive, motivation. Mm-hmm. That is the motivation. They will not leave you behind. They will not disappear on you. You will not have to go look for your mastiff. If you do, something is wrong. He's stolen or dead. Mm-hmm. Yep. He'll come back no matter what. So even dogs in heat will not make my, my I get the neighbor dog and she's so small. It's the only neighbor I have that it's anatomically impossible for my dogs to to do anything and they don't care i don't know if they know she's not the same breed or can't but but they will they will choose me over going to the neighbor they they won't even go over there they don't care um it's just the type of breed they are Mm -hmm. so even even a dog in heat it might pique their interest but it will not inevitably make that dog leave you where I don't know. A lot of other breeds, I think, would be like, screw you. She's in heat, and I'm following her till the day I die. Yeah. And, uh, yep. So yeah. these dogs aren't, don't seem to be like that. And, and again, I'll bring them to a vet to be collected for a breeding or something. There's dogs all over. And they march to room six. That's the room we go to down at Stillwater every single time since the beginning. And they will go walk to room six, stare at the door like a stone, like a gargoyle, and pay no attention to any dogs or anything that is going on in that building. And I find that extremely strange as well, that they are that, you know, intelligent and no. And again, what dog isn't over trying to smell and play with the, all the other dogs? They don't care. They, they really don't. And they're good with all other breeds. Um, I've had them around every breed you can think of via vets and, and you know, absolutely no aggression. Uh, doesn't mean that when they bark, it doesn't scare the other dog because it does. It's so loud and beefy sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had dogs just scream like something happened and just from seeing them. <laughs> you know, a lady had a boxer. She was walking down. I have a dead end road. It was coming down the road. And the dude, the, the boys ran to the edge of the driveway just barking. And that dog laid down petrified and screamed. And the lady goes, they didn't do anything. I don't know what's wrong with my dog. I said, she's probably just, you know, a little overtaken. I said, let's introduce them. And it wasn't minutes later. And they were frolicking on the road having a blast. And I've seen her many times since. And she said, oh, yeah, she looks forward to playing with your big fellas. And, uh, you know, so, but the initial shock of how big they are, I think, can, can alarm other dogs yeah. sometimes. Yeah, no, no doubt. Unnecessary. Yeah, they're unnecessarily afraid of it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, as nice as I can. Uh, it does happen from time to time. It depends on the dog, on the other dog itself. Mm-hmm. But, but never ever have I had those dogs show any aggression to other dogs um, at all. So, and that's another thing that I think is is pretty comforting. You know that you can go to Canal Park and not worry about your dog tearing off after another male dog. They don't care. They don't care at all. Mm-hmm. It's like they know, you know, it's like Muhammad Ali. Do you think he cared if somebody said they were tougher than him? No. He, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> and that's kind of their, their attitude is I don't have anything to prove. I, I just don't care. Yeah. And they don't really get excited over other dogs. And I find that pretty neat. So mm-hmm. truth is, uh-huh. you know, if, if I wanted to be a breeder, a full-fledged, you know, all I would have to do is, is get a couple of girls, hand select some, mm-hmm. and do it that way. Uh, however, you know, having both sexes on site can be very troublesome. Uh, I, I often believe, too, that uh, that it's just, I, I like the all-male regime for a lot of reasons, and I don't, I don't tell people this a lot of the time, but I will. Um, keeping them all related means they are all concerned with the same genetic code being given out. Um, so that, so in a wolf pack, 
you know, a, a wolf with none of the alpha male's genes. He's dead. But his own son is is safe from ultimate death. He'll still put him in his place, but he ain't going to kill him because he knows that that's the next generation and this is one of the same. So I believe that keeping him related keeps the peace. It also increases competition, which increases testosterone, which increases semen quality, which increases uh, physical appearance. So by keeping them related and all males, it benefits the stud universe in ways that I can't describe. It's partially why Ringo's nine and has a semen count of almost three billion. Most large breeds don't even get to a billion. He's only gotten better through age and better as he's grown. And same with my other ones. Um, same thing. And so it's, it's more of a friendly competition because they might get into, you know, yelling matches, but there's almost never any physical contact whatsoever, uh, yet they compete. And again, I have a feeling if I had, you know, a three-year-old non-related dog, which I guess I'm going to find out, but I'm going to raise him as a pup with the other ones. But, but at sexual maturity, I worry that if the dog isn't related, that they're going to not want him in the pack. Um, I don't know that yet, I, but that's, that's a crusade that I'm going to find out one way or the other. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, but I hope it does. But I really strongly believe that all animals, and this is a fact scientifically, I also have a degree in environmental science, biology, and art. Um, so I do have some background there. And timber wolves can smell by one track from glands on their feet, the age of that animal, the size, the sex, and all of that and whether it's related or not so they're they are well aware that that is their son or that is their relative and i do believe that's why i don't have horrible dog fights and problems like that and yet it keeps that that more friendly competition going um and they teach each other things and help each other build muscle and play you know the tug of war and stuff and all of that doing it amongst themselves and and stuff like that occasionally yeah there's one that gets upset but again i've slow motioned all of it and they don't ever even touch each other you'd swear that there was this massive battle watch it in slow-mo it's nothing more than a dance to see who's got the louder voice and doing the biggest display and they're just communicating that way and the truth of the matter is, is if i went up and tried to interrupt that or had them on a leash and kept pulling the dog. You ever see those where before they dog fight, they're on leashes and they keep pulling that leash? Yeah. That charges a dog up. So when when you're at a dog park and another dog comes up to mess with your dog and you're jerking your dog back, you're just revving his ass up. Mm -hmm. You need to let them communicate the way they have to without you trying to intervene. Because the second you do, you're... What winds up happening is if I go up and try to get in the middle of an argument my dogs are having, now there's one dog growling and Ringo thinks that Paul's growling at me and Ringo's now mad that Paul might hurt me and Paul's mad that Ringo's growling and might, and all of a sudden I become this thing that they need to protect because they're already in this thing and then they end up fighting over who's the, so the, honestly, the, the, the very best thing you could ever do is, you know, I try to have a pail of water and I douse them with cold water. I'll stop it. Um, or you, you literally walk the other way. So they, they start getting into it. You go, okay, I'm leaving. And you start, you don't get 30 feet away and the fight stops and they're following you like, like whatever. But if I try to go up in there and, and tell them who gets to get the tug of war or whatever, uh, it's going to cause a fight. So mm -hmm. You know, keeping your distance and trusting the dogs and knowing that, you know, again, I, all I have is, you know, 30 years of experience. I've never had another dog hurt another dog. So if in 30 years of doing this, I've never had an injury, I have to trust that, that they're not going to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. They never have, ever. But if they do get in arguments that they have to deal with through themselves, and again, that does raise competition, testosterone, and really helps uh, building your dog. Mm -hmm. um, having another male dog present helps a great deal with semen quality, physique, and all of the things that, that a stud needs to have. Um, being around a bunch of girls, I don't know. I don't think that, uh, you know, they'd end up fighting amongst, you know, I feel like if I had a female in heat, that might throw those guys over the, the limit of tolerance where they will hurt each other to, to, to be first to get honor or something like that mm -hmm. so so just uh 
adding a female to the mix is something I don't really want to do. Um, you know, where in that respect, maybe I would co-own or something and have the female off the premises. But I, I just, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. And the regime I have going seems to work perfectly. Um, and adding, you know, a different sex, I think it would, would compromise what I do. Um, so, you know, it takes up almost all the time I have now working on guys and making sure they, they do what they got to do every day and our tip top health and keeping their semen count good and, and everything else, uh, on the up and up, it takes up a lot of my time and to add a, a whole she beetle section, I think that the guys would suffer. And, and so, you know, I kind of leave the girls up to, um, who comes to me and the health testing and the research I do and, and, and do it that way. So it's not, as, it's not as financially beneficial for me, but that's not what I'm in this for to begin with. If I have a hard roll, my son and a dog on a log in the woods for the whole weekend, it only costs me about eight bucks and I have the best time anybody could ever have and making memories with my son that someday when I'm not here, um, he'll, he'll have to reach back on and, and that type of legacy and background. So, you know, when my dad was dying, he made me promise that I'd make sure my kids walked the same trails we did. And I gave him my word and well, those trails are going to stay open. They're going to stay padded down. They're not going to get overgrown, not on my watch. So, and I always tell people too, you know, if you don't, if you don't like to come out here, then don't, um, you know, catch me if you can, you know, where I'll be and I'm not hard to find. Right. So, yep. If you get all, all are welcome. But uh, I'm not changing where I find and feel the best. And I know my dogs do and my kids do. And, you know, so that's that's all I want out of life is the ability to keep doing and doing this and be able to be outdoors as much as I can and to bring that to everybody and show them that, you know, a simple little walk in the spring in June, you can find turtles, mud turtles, snapping, just a whole world of awesomeness that really exists that's there that anybody can do and again i think if i look back at the memories i remember it's all stuff like that you know i I vaguely remember the big game night i had with my buddies uh you know big boxing game night i don't remember any of that i don't remember any of the awesome monumental wins i did on a game i don't remember any of it it's Mm -hmm. to me you know and so if you run into a hard time in life and that's all you got is that I, I strongly feel like, you know, having a, a good background in the other way is what can make you hold on in those dark times that everybody has. So, you know, if, if, if you're going through a terrible time for some reason and, and you put all your stock in a machine, you're going to find that out when you need somebody. Yeah, so, for sure. I yep. Think- and it sucks and it's true and it's true. It's true for everybody. And I'm tied to the phone as well. Um, but I always tell people, I, I'm on this phone all the time so that one day we can all throw them in the river. Balance yeah. is key. Yeah, Balance is key. In this day and age, you know, you're going to have to have some techno background for mm-hmm. a kid up. I mean, there's going to be the jobs and things that are computer-based and technology-based and screen-based. But that's where, okay, let's say that's your eight-hour-a-day job and your passion is gaming. So now what's your whole life? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you need to, a person has to be aware of that. And if you're a parent, you have to be aware that your kids have to do what you do. So if you're on a screen 24 seven, they don't have a choice. They don't, they just don't, they have to do what you do. If you're not out doing something, you know, they can't be. So if I spend all day on the phone working and doing this stuff and, and forget to unplug, that's what my kid did all day. And he suddenly, and it does, it breaks my heart. If I go to bed at night and it's a beautiful, beautiful evening, one of the last few summer evenings that are going to be warm left. And I know my kid sat in the bedroom and played a video game that entire time. I tell him straight up, you'll never be nine years old on this day and get this evening back. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It is gone. It is gone. And you'll never know what would have happened. You'll never know because you never went out there to find out. And to me, that's a tragedy to have, you know, games on a rainy, shitty day or 20 below. Hell yeah. Let's have a game day all yeah. day. That's what it's for. That is what it's for. Snow day at school. Yeah. Let's play games all day, man. That's what it's for. Uh, but, but to have that end up slowly overtaking every bit of your free time, 
you know, we're all going to be zombies, except me. <laughs> right, right. And I just tease people that way. I always say, I was born to lead you guys away to, to help with the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> there you go. You know, and if, if I inspire one person, one kid or, or, or adult to get out that evening and go walk the riverbank with their dog and they go home feeling like they did something and that they matter and that they're a part of something huge, that is all that I need to know that I did for that day to know that what I did mattered to some degree. And so being popular, I don't care. Uh, money, I don't care. TV, I don't care. None of it. I never went to anybody. I never solicited. I never did any of those things. I just kept doing what I do, hoping that maybe someday somebody would notice. And fortunately, fortunately they did. Um, because I do believe that, you know, overall, you know, I, I run big groups. I belong to like 70 different master specific groups. And prior to, to showing the world what these dogs can do, I didn't see a lot of posts of them swimming. I didn't see a lot of posts of them working. And over the course of my career, I see more and more, especially on my Fur Beatles friends and family page, of these dogs swimming and happy, smiling people that are proud of their dogs and how they can move and, and how many people were in awe of seeing. You know, it's fun to just even see a 200-pound, 250-pound dog swim. is awe-inspiring. It's like seeing a bear, having a pet bear, and be able to watch it navigate that water as if they would have had two years ago to get to that elk or whatever, whatever was going down. And again, I see it in the photos, and, and I've had many, many, many people tell me um, that, that they've noticed that too. So the overall, I believe I've impacted the breed and the expectations people have of them. And, and also showed them how easy this breed is to take everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a gal that um, a friend of mine knew, and I had a breeding down in the cities, and he wanted to stop and visit her on the way back. And she had this beautiful apartment in the cities and all white leather sofa and furniture, and I had Ringo with. We couldn't bring him to the, the place to go eat and do any of those things, so he had to stay in her apartment, and I was petrified. I'm like, what if he, she goes, we'll just have to taste that risk. I go, if he goes on your, your white, your genuine white leather, beautiful, thousands of dogs, God, there's nothing I can do. And she goes, I, I'll wipe it off. Just don't worry about it. And I left him in that apartment for about three hours. And when he came back, he never moved from the place that he laid down. Mm -hmm. She even looked at me and said, I have never seen a dog. He didn't dig in any, he didn't move. There was no uh, evidence that he had moved from that spot whatsoever. So that's the type of trust and the type of dog and there's no excuse um you know not to bring them with and have them be as much of a part of your life as possible provided you you choose that right breed from the from the get-go well number one is i would never ever and there are excuses up and down the block for people why they don't do OFA. cleared through parentage cleared by who who you got some kind of okay so no that doesn't mean anything um so being 100% committed to health is number one to me. Um, not only would I never want someone to purchase a pup for a lifetime of, of companionship and have it cost them thousands and thousands in vets before the first year is up and have it, this animal die of something at two or three years old, um, that is heartbreaking. It breaks people's hearts and it, and it, 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 it it is bad for the breed because people lose faith in it. So number one, you know, believe in yourself and, and, and believe in testing. It's if you are going to make any type of, of financial um, gain out of it, you have no excuse not to get that health testing done. That should be number one. Number one, before you even think about anything is make sure you have something worth uh, worthy of breeding on the inside they can look as beautiful and big and robust and awesome as you want but if they are not good on the inside you're setting yourself up for failure for one um having that health testing back them up back you up is also important because you know in a, in addition to all the testing things still can happen at least you can go to these people with a very solid face saying you know i did the absolute best i could with all the things available today to make sure that we did the best breeding we possibly can. And, you know, to date, I've been very lucky with no issues uh, with my dogs, no major issues um, or of any kind. But 
And I do attribute that to making sure that my guys are health tested and clear and so are the girls. Uh, secondly, you know, don't be afraid to follow your own gut and your own beliefs. Um, that doesn't mean jump in and try to make a splash by uprooting everything and, and start breeding with uh, making cross breeds and all of this kind of stuff. But, but also know that, you know, you have your own vision of how this breed should be and provided you work within the standards, you should be able to put your own, your own flavor on, on that, on what you do. Uh, um, again, starting with, with a great base is, is, is so important. That health testing is so important. And to be able to trace their lineage, which means, you know, AKC registered. That's not something to sit there and put your nose in the air and go, mine's AKC registered. That's not what it is. It is, this is a history of where this dog came from and all of his parents. And that is priceless information. Um, you can go back then and check all the health testing, blah, blah. But you got to contribute your part to that pedigree too um i don't show because i'm just not i like to be i don't like big crowds it's just been something you know so even when someone's filming me it's only a couple people and i'm out in my element so i'm very comfortable that way um so you know i i you need to have people show also um you know i show the way i can and, and prove them the way i can but it's also very important that that you do show these dogs um to AKC and bring them to shows because there's two two sides to that coin. You owe it um, to show the dog and show what you've got. And you also, and that's why I have clients that show. Uh, they show my puppies and occasionally um, I'll release one with breeding rights provided that person will show them, champion them, improve them and help test them. Well, then I don't have a problem because you're doing it right. You're doing it correctly and you're making sure health is number one and you're not going to put a black X on my name. So you know, I, I try my best that way. And so, and then I guess one more piece of advice is, you know, to accomplish great things, you need to be around great people and, you know, being able to tell who is a genuine person and who isn't is important and to, you know, hold integrity above money. Now, in other words, if I wanted to design or breed and just sling semen like a crazy man, I could do all sorts of things like that and cash out and be done and not have to worry about much of any of it, but that's not something I'll ever do. Uh, I stand behind integrity and I'm known for that. And I do want to help this breed and not just the breed, but the people, because I don't care how healthy a dog is. If you bring him home and he lays for three years on an apartment building floor and you give him every bit of table scraps and food and treats and try to overlove your dog, He's not going to have a long life. Right. That's just the end of that. You, neither will you. If all you do is sit inside, you know, and there's people that are tied to a job where that's, they have to, mm -hmm. and they're not healthy because of it. And that's why, you know, that type of job, when you're done working and punch out, the only thing on your mind should be getting out in the woods or, or doing something like that, whether, whatever hobby that is that gets you out and active. You know, I am a strong believer if you don't start that engine, it doesn't get started and your, your body's content just sitting. So, you know, an object in motion tends to stay in motion and an object at rest tends to stay at rest. And that's Isaac Newton. And he wasn't wrong. And that goes for dogs, people, and anything else that you can think of. So, yeah, no doubt. You know, I don't want a dog that at three years old, I have to leave home when I go to the woods. That's not something I ever want to see. I want my dog active till the day he can't be and, and, um, you know, Ringo's living evidence. He can jump at nine years old from a standstill, 218 pounds, into the back of a pickup without a running start at all. And I watch it and go, how in the hell can he do that? And he does. Mm -hmm. And I was told in the beginning, oh, you'll have his elbows will be terrible. By four years old, you'll have those elbows wore out. They'll be ruined. He won't be able to walk and all this. Is that so? Or are you going to tell me when he's 15 and jumping in the back of that truck? They're going to tell me that every day scheduled limited exercise is very good for everything. Yeah. Now, if you're taking a dog you had laying on its ass for a year and you plan this rocky mountain trip and decide he's going to accompany you up that mountain, you're, you're, he's going to get life lighted back out. Yeah. Just like anybody, anything else that you try to do that to, that's just totally not fair to, to do that to an animal. So it's a slow and steady process. 
um, from beginning to end to get them to where they need to be. It's not something that just magically happens. You know, a champion boxer doesn't become a champion without a lot of hard work and a long road. And, um, and that's what makes them, that's part of why they're a champion. They persevered and kept trying and, and working through the pain and that kind of stuff. And in the end, uh, hopefully it benefits. And, you know, Ringo's story isn't over, um, but I really hope to see him continue to break the mold.